1945, the Malay Peninsula has nine separate states. Jungle clothes its mountain backbone like the hair of a tiger. Only the sea coast and river bars are developed. Slightly less than half its five and a half million people are Malays, easygoing farmers, civil servants, the clannish original settlers of the land. Almost as many are Chinese, merchants, laborers. There are deep religious, economic, and language differences between Malay and Chinese. Indians form a large minority, and there's a small group of Europeans. Rubber, largely grown by European and Chinese planters, helps give Malaya the second highest living standard in Asia. The peninsula is a major source of the world's tin. The British rule this rich area, not by conquest, but by request of the local sultans. Malaya also dominates the main Pacific trade routes. The British are just restoring order after World War II, when out of the jungles comes a force of communist guerrillas, killing and burning. The irony is that the British had trained and armed this force, mostly Chinese, to fight Japan. The first targets of the guerrillas are European-owned plantations and tin mines. Workers, executives, and their families move inside compounds. For 12 years, English, Dutch, and Chinese estate managers will live with guns in their hands and lights burning through the night. 10% of all European managers will be murdered. The terror has begun. The British start with the advantage of strong administrative control and a loyal bureaucracy, largely Malay. They register the population and impose strict curfews. Britain's labor government sends Sir Henry Gurney to Malaya. He comes, he says, not just to quell a revolt, but to win the minds and hearts of the people. And in fact, Malays are rallying to a special constabulary force, taking the Queen's shilling, a traditional British enlistment bonus. Thus, although the guerrillas try to use a pan-Malay nationalism as a cover for their communism, this propaganda is a failure. Britain transfers troops from Hong Kong and sends the men who usually guard the palaces of London the Coldstream Guards, the Scots Guards, the Grenadier Guards. Australians are brought in. In addition to these conventional forces, the British organize a ferret force of men with guerrilla experience from World War II. They are to penetrate the jungle, meet the enemy on his own ground. The helicopter becomes a weapon. According to Mao Zedong, the guerrillas are the fish in a sea, the sea being the people and the land that support them. In these terms, the helicopter becomes a fishing boat hovering over the fishermen who hunt the gorillas. The gorillas are hard to find, although the jungle hides large camps in which a so-called Malay Races Liberation Army is training. A few are hardcore communists. Many are merely inspired by Chinese, not Malayan nationalism. Very many have simply been recruited by terror. has a grimly amusing handicap. A planter, his rubber trees blasted, sues for damages. So the RAF must avoid bombing rubber trees. The guerrillas learn this, and every plantation on the map becomes a potential bomb shelter for them. Build up and all, the war is still going badly in 1950, when Sir Harold Briggs arrives to direct operations. His plan will soon counter the guerrilla strategy that comes direct from Mao Zedong. First, Briggs moves the sea in which the guerrillas have been swimming. The sea is a half a million Chinese who have settled illegally between the jungles and the settled parts of Malaya. They are poor and hungry for land. In mixed terror and sympathy for the guerrillas, they reluctantly provide the communists with food, money, and a flow of recruits. 
Briggs establishes these people in newly built villages, largely by persuasion, partly with threats. Among the people moved are countless Minyuan, literally in Chinese, the helpers, the secret communist fifth column. A gap is thus opened between the guerrillas in the jungle and their sea. The plan brings many to the villages who help the guerrillas only through fear, but it also offers social services, education, and legal ownership of land. An alienated and unstable segment of the population is thus offered its first taste of citizenship in a modern state. Above all, the plan promises safety, but the security forces must prove to these people that they can protect them, that the guerrillas will not come back and murder them for defecting. Building new villages is more expensive than merely hunting down men. And more than 500 new villages will be built. People who once lay sick and bitter on the edge of the jungle now get care. Chinese, Indians, and Malays are coaxed into cooperating. The races live together, eat together. Food, however, is strictly controlled, not because it is scarce, but to cut off the guerrilla food supply. Each person gets what he needs to live on, with nothing left over for the Minyuan to smuggle to the jungle. Yet the communists still exact a secret tax, sometimes just a cigarette package of rice per day per person passed through the barbed wire. Collected, this is a substantial hoard, but it must be moved over roads controlled by the security forces. Steadily, the guerrillas get less and less rice. On the military side, Briggs orders his forces to press into the jungle, hunting in small patrols, inviting attack. Hard up for food and willing helpers, the guerrillas break up into small groups, are more elusive, but make more frequent attacks. There are so many more incidents, it appears that Briggs is losing his war. But almost for the first time, prisoners and defectors are coming from the guerrilla bands. Assassins lay in wait 26 hours, undetected and unbetrayed. The ambush murder in October 1951 of Sir Henry Gurney, who himself had come to win minds and hearts, is the guerrilla signal they have not yet lost this war. The force hunting the killers is called the largest ever gathered to unearth a tiny handful of bandits. But all it finds are a few illegal guns, five bodies in the jungle, and a notebook meticulously listing the traffic along the road that Gurney traveled. The security forces are growing, but there has been no quick victory, only endless preparation for it. Worn out, Briggs resigns. The European planters are demanding more action. The Briggs plan has borne fruit, but not fast enough. Nonetheless, support from the Malayan people is steadily growing. that there are sick, hungry, and disgusted guerrillas in the jungle. The security forces coax them to surrender. A voice plane cruises over the jungle, playing in Chinese a recording by the new British chief, Sir Gerald Templer, pledging good treatment. When murders occur, food is cut off. The people are given a chance to place secret information in sealed boxes, leading to the roundup of many terrorists, freeing the people still further from fear. As confidence and control grow in the villages, Templar sends more of his army forces deep into the jungle. Almost literally, the paratroops hop onto the backs of the hiding terrorists. And they will go, not simply as hit-and-run anti-guerrillas, but to establish permanent forts, accessible only by air. The 
Reds never succeed in taking over a settled region in which they can show the people an ability to govern, make a show of fulfilling propaganda promises, or rest and feed their troops systematically. To do this, as the Viet Cong do in Vietnam, is an essential of communist guerrilla strategy. In Malaya, they have only the jungle, and now the security forces are in the heart of their jungle. What help the guerrillas get comes from childlike aborigines long neglected by their governments. They have little understanding of the struggle, but quickly see the value of government protection and services, soon become valuable allies. Thus the struggle for Malaya began with a communist drive to transform a colonial society by violence. By 1953, it is the British and their Malay hosts who are making the revolution and winning the war. But there are years of struggle ahead. It is 1953, a former British military governor in Germany, General